So the talk that I'm going to give tonight uh, is entitled Assembling the Perfect MySQL Toolbox. Um, I first gave this talk back in April um, at the Percona Live conference. Um, so it's designed to be a 50-minute talk, but tonight I'll, I'll enjoy the fact that I don't have any time constraints. So if we want to stay longer, you know, if people have questions in the middle, just shout them out. Um, I'll also take some questions at the end, you know, and uh, I'll uh, enjoy the fact that we don't have time constraints. <laughs> um, so first of all, just an introduction of who I am. Uh, my name is Ike Walker. Um, I'm a database architect at a company called Flight. Um, Flight is an advertising technology platform. Probably nobody in this room is familiar with Flight, but that's OK. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm Io Walker. Um, and I also blog a lot at uh, mechanics.flight.com. That's my company's engineering blog. Uh, most of what I write is about is MySQL, but I also blog sometimes about Cassandra and Hive and Redis and some other data stores that we use. Um, so this, this talk is about what is in my toolbox, specifically what's in MySQL toolbox. Um, so I'm not here today to tell you about some product that I've made or that my company's made or some new tool that I made that I've open sourced. Um, what this is about is more a methodology um, that I've found works for me and I'm hoping may work for other people too. Um, in terms of finding some of the great open source, source tools that are out there in the MySQL ecosystem, learning how to use those tools and uh, bringing them into my toolbox so it can become part of my everyday. Um, I can use them to you know, make my work easier, make my products better, you know, make my databases better, and, and have more confidence in them. Um, so let's talk about some of, the, some of the main things that are in my toolbox. So these are, these are three of the, the big pillars of, uh, of what I use. Um, only two of them have actual logos, so I, I sort of cheated with the third one. So, uh, so this is MySQL Sandbox, um, which is a, a favorite of mine um, that Giuseppe made. Um, it's a great tool for making multiple installations of MySQL. Um, so on my laptop, for example, I can spin up a uh, MySQL 5.6 replication topology and do some testing on it, and then throw that away and bring up a MySQL 5.7 topology or have them up at the same time. <laughs> and then test 5.0, 5.1, 5.5, whatever. Um, so it's a really easy way to spin up new instances of MySQL, different versions, try out different storage engines, you know, compare, test things on, on different versions and stuff like that. So I'm a big fan of MySQL Sandbox. Um, Percona Toolkit is one that almost everybody knows about. Um, that's distributed by Percona. It's a whole bunch of different tools that do a lot of different things. Um, it's mostly written in Perl, but you know, if you look through that, I'm sure you can find at least five or six tools that you'll find useful. Um, and the bottom one, it doesn't have a logo. Does anybody want to guess what that is? Can anybody recognize that? That's the Boston Common. There you go. That's the Boston Common. So I chose that for Common Schema, oh. <laughs> uh, which is a tool that Shlomi Noach made, um, which I think is, is another favorite of mine, but he didn't make a, a cute logo, so I had to use the Boston Common instead. Um, so these are the, the three that I'm going to mostly talk about today. Um, so Percona Toolkit, a little bit of history of that. Um, it was originally called Mockkit um, that Baron Schwartz wrote, um, and then it became a Percona Toolkit when he was at Percona. It's still maintained by Percona. Um, you can download it on their website. Um, I think they just released a new version just a couple days ago, 2.2.10. .2 um, Common Schema, I mentioned the Shlomi's thing. That's on uh, Google Code. Um, that's a cool one because it's very easy to install the whole thing. You just download it. It's a SQL script that you import. Um, and then it's got a bunch of views and stored procedures and other things. Um, I'll get into a lot of the details on it more later. And then there's MySQL Sandbox I mentioned before, um, which is something you made. Um, and that's the website for that. Um, so what are the tools that I use in these? You know, this, these, each of these, I'm talking about my toolbox, but each one of these toolkits has multiple pieces. So there's a whole lot of different stuff in there. So Percona Toolkit has ptconfigdiff, um, which is a really cool tool if you want to compare the my.cnf files from two databases, you know, and you don't want to just use diff to do it because the, uh, you know, things might be in different order but the same, you know, and you want to compare them. That's a cool tool because you can just throw two config files at it and it'll tell you exactly what the differences are. Um, so I use that a lot if I've got, you know, two of my many servers are exhibiting different symptoms and I want to see are they configured the same, I can compare their config files. Um, PT FIFO split um, is, is kind of a funky one. It's not really database specific, um, but it's a good way to, uh, if you have a large file, um, to sort of split it into, into multiple chunks and, and get multiple virtual files out of it. Um, the specific use case where I use that is if I have uh, a giant tab delimited file, say, with you know a million lines in it, um, and I want to load that into my database. 
rather than trying to load that all in in a single transaction um, using load data in file, what I'll do is I'll use PT FIFO split so that I can impose a, a standard uh, line limit on it. So, you know, if I have a file that I don't know how big it's going to be, it might be 100,000 lines today, 2 million lines tomorrow, but I've done some testing and determined that my database works optimally if you give it 10,000 rows at a time then I can use PT FIFO split to magically transform that file into chunks of 10,000. Um, it works very well for that. Um, PT Heartbeat, this is one that uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with. It's very, very simple, but it's very, very important. So what PT Heartbeat does is lets you um, monitor how far your MySQL slaves are behind the master and to find out how far they actually are. So if you use something like show slave status and look at seconds behind master, sometimes that's accurate, sometimes it's not. Um, so, and MySQL still hasn't given us a good, reliable, built-in way to do that. So PT Heartbeat is a very easy way. It's just a replace statement that runs once per second on the master. And so if you want to know how far the slaves are behind, you just pull the current timestamp from that, and you, you can see how far behind they are. Um, so that's a good one. PT Online Schema Change is one that's been really, really important in the past. Um, as people are starting to upgrade to 5.6, which has online DDL, that's a little bit less important. Um, but uh, it's still a really cool tool. So if you're doing an, an alter table statement, um, you know, that's going to add a column to some, you know, 100 gigabyte table and it's going to take 20 hours to run, then that table is essentially locked while you're doing that. Um, PT online schema change um, can, can help you get around that and do sort of online DDL. So what it does is it creates a copy of your table, um, uses triggers to keep the, ta the two tables in sync. Um, it makes a schema change on the copy of the table, and then once all the row data is updated and they're completely in sync, it uses a, an atomic rename to swap out the tables. Um, so that's a cool tool. Um, PT Query Digest um, is a good one for um, looking at slow query logs and things like that. Um, PT Slave Delay is one that I used to use, but I don't need any more. So this is if you want to keep a replica, um, you want to intentionally delay a replica. Um, so say, you know, for disaster recovery, you want to have a copy of your production database that's seven days old or 30 days old or something like that and store up all the binary logs so you can fast forward it to a certain point in time. Um, then that's a tool that you can use to say, you know, I want to keep this database seven days behind and it's, it's a replica, it's got all your production data, but it's exactly seven days behind. Um, the reason I speak in the past tense about this mostly is that actually in, in MySQL 5.6, which I've recently upgraded to, um, this is native, there's a native functionality where you can set master delay um, on your database um, and you know, say how many seconds you want it to be behind. So you can set it to a week behind, a month behind, a day behind, whatever, um, and that's all natively built into replication um, once you're on 5.6. I assume most people here probably aren't on 5.6 in production yet, but it's one nice little goodie that you can get when you get into there. Um, PT table checksum. Uh, this is a really, really important tool. Um, so this is if you're using MySQL replication and you want to know that, that what's in your slave database matches what's in your master database, um, this is the tool to use. Uh, so what it does is it checksums all the rows on the master database in such a way that those checksums replicate to the slave and then um, you can run comparisons to find out, to either confirm that the data is the same or find out how the data is different. Um, if you do find differences and you want to fix them, there's a tool for that, PT Table Sync, um, which will either run or just generate the statements to, to fix the data on the master as you want. There's some, it's not the safest tool in the world, there's some caveats and ways that it can break your data I'll get into later, um, but it's a, it's a good, good option to have. Um, moving on to Common Schema, there's a lot of good stuff in this. Um, so there's Query Script, which is a, uh, basically a way to do scripting in SQL. Um, so it's, it's something you should read up on because it's, it's a really powerful concept and it's the kind of thing that I see people, um, so I go on Stack Overflow sometimes and answer questions about MySQL and often I'll see people wanting to do stuff in MySQL that you can't do. They want to do loops and things like that. And so you have to say, oh, you know, use the scripting language of your choice. Do it in Python or Perl or Bash and people are like, I don't know any of that. I don't want to do that. I want to do it in the database. Um, and so query script is actually, Shlomi has done a really clever thing where you can actually do that. You can do for loops in the database and you can, you know, do a lot of those simple scripting things that you used to have to do a scripting language for. Now you can do it natively in, in SQL. So query script is really powerful. Um, the run and split uh, functions are, are really powerful. I use those a lot. Um, I give a couple of other examples. Kill all you can use um, to, if you have a lot of processes that are 
running on you know and causing problems in your database. You want to kill all all processes for a certain user or on a certain table. Um, you can do that. So that's a really good one. Duplicate grantee um, is a nice shortcut. Um, if you have a user account that's set up with certain privileges and you want to make a copy of that user account, um, you can just run duplicate grantee and it'll make you know a new user that's got exactly the same privileges. Um, that's a cool one. MySQL sandbox, uh, the list is a little bit simpler, um, but you know you can use make sandbox to build one database, make replication sandbox if you want a master and some number of slaves. Um, and as I mentioned before, MySQL Sandbox is really cool if you're testing multiple versions of MySQL. So, for example, my company just recently did an upgrade, like I said, from 5.5 to 5.6. Um, you know, Sandbox made it easy for me to test a lot of things out in 5.6 on my laptop to see how they were going to perform, you know, and find out if it was really viable for us to make that jump. Um, and then the other way is sometimes I'll test old versions. Like there was a, a patch that I was working on for one of the Percona Toolkit tools recently. Um, because there was, I needed to make a small change to it, um, and I wanted wanted to know if it worked with previous versions of MySQL. So I was able to, to spin up, you know, a 5.0 and a 5.1 sandbox and try it on that pretty easily. Um, so th this is a list of other tools, you know, because I'm mostly going to kind of hit on those big three. But there's a whole lot of great tools in the MySQL in us, it, the ecosystem. So in you know, top, PS Helper, Sys Schema, which is sort of replacing PS Helper, I think. Um, those are both views on top of performance schema, um, which I think is going to become really important as people start getting out of 5.6 and 5.7. Uh, poor Men's Profiler, Flex Views, PMySQL, Securich, you know, there's a whole bunch of tools out there. Um, so I'm just sort of scratching the surface. Um, but th those are all cool, cool tools to look at. If you haven't heard of any of them, you should, you should look them up. Mike? Yes. What do you tend to do with PMP? I'm curious. Uh, I don't use it. Um, but I know that uh, some people have found it useful. So yes. I've, has Flight ever used it to, to send information to Oracle about MySQL? Poor Men's Profile? No. I haven't. It's more something that I've seen people talk about before. And, you know, it seems like it might be useful, but I've never found a specific use for it. Okay. Do you have any experience with it? Well, yeah, we, our users use it to help us yeah. make TopoDB better. It's yeah. A, it's a good way, I mean, it's, it's aptly named. It's a good way for someone to come to us and say, hey, Shutdown's taken forever. Yeah, and we'll have them run PMP, and then we can find out what's stuck. You know, what's consuming the resources at the uh, code level, not necessarily yeah. at the top level. Okay. So, so like if I were a premium support user with Oracle and opened up a case, they might ask me to run it to sure something. Okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's, it's not the kind of use, but, but yeah, like you said, that's a, that's a good use case for that. Um, it's probably the best name ever for a tool. Performance profiling. <laughs> yeah. Self documenting. Yes. All right, so this is, uh, this is the overall theme of my talk tonight. Um, I felt like I really needed to come up with a catchy acronym, because everything needs a catchy acronym. So my acronym is that you should assemble your toolkit like a box. Sorry, your toolbox like a boss. I wrote the punchline there. So there's Bruce Springsteen. He's the boss. Everybody knows he's the boss. We want to be like Bruce Springsteen. Um, we want to be the boss. So what that stands for is you want to buy the right tool, you want to own it, sell it, Success. I'll go through what all that means, but that, if you take one thing away from that, assemble your toolbox like a boss. So first of all, I say buy it. What's the deal with that? You know, I thought all these tools were free, right? I was talking about open source tools. A lot of us, you know, don't want to spend money on software. I don't. So, so what do I mean by buy it? Um, so what I mean by buy it isn't about making a financial investment. It's more about making an investment of time. So you know, it's easy to find a cool tool and say to your boss, "Hey, this is really cool. Let's use it." Um, but you don't want to use it if you don't really understand it, right? So I think you, it's, it's one thing to, to find the right tool, but if you really want to make it part of your workflow um, and make your, your life easier and your database better, um, you need to, to invest the time and make the commitment that this is a tool that we're going to use. So that's why I said, you know, there's a whole bunch of tools that I listed on the list that I think are probably cool, but I don't really use, but there's a few that I've found that I've invested the time to learn how they work, made the commitment to them, so uh, you know, even though there is no financial transaction, I feel like you know I've bought those tools. Like that's part of my toolbox. That's something I use every day. Uh, so on the other side of that is own it. You know, so what do I mean by own it? If I'm not talking about a financial transaction, I'm not talking about a software license. What do I mean by owning these tools? So to me, owning it means you know you really need to figure out how it works. You don't want it to be a black box 
that you just point it at your database and it it does some function. Um, you know, you really need to know how know that it works and know how it works. So um, <laughs> the way that I do that is I try it in a test environment. You know, I mentioned MySQL Sandbox is really good for that, um, for testing things out. You know, everybody's got a QA environment, stage environment, whatever it is. You know, before you use these tools in production, you really want to test them out. Um, and you need to know how to test them out. Um, another thing I would say is look at the code. Because, you know, it's some of us get into the source code of MySQL itself, not that many of us, but if you want to actually look at the tools that people created, the tools are much, e the code's much more accessible. Um, that if you want to look at how um, Percona Toolkit tools work, they're, they're Perl scripts. And even if you don't know Perl, it's not that hard to dig through them and, and figure out what they're doing. So, uh, you know, one thing that I always try to do is, is I always look at the code before I use a tool because I want to, you know, know what makes it tick uh, and know how it works. Um, and another thing about owning it is, you know, becoming, being a member of the MySQL community, whenever I, I use a tool, I want to, you know, make sure that I'm helping the tool get better. So I submit feedback to the person who created it or maintained it. I'll write blog posts about it. I guess I'm getting ahead of myself on that part, but, um, yeah, you want to own it. You want to you give feedback if you find a bug or, you know, have a feature idea. Talk to the people who created it. Um, so sell it. What do you mean sell it? I'm not a salesperson. I don't want to do that. So what I mean by sell it is basically convince other people to use it. It's kind of like what I'm doing tonight, you know, talking to you guys about these tools and this methodology, is if you find something that solves a problem, you should try to spread the word and help other people do the same thing. Um, so one thing that I personally do a lot with that is I blog about it. So if I find it, if I have a specific problem that I solve with a specific tool, I'll try to write a blog post to share that experience with other people. Because I've, I've learned a lot reading other people's blog posts, I feel like that's a a really good way to communicate, you know, hey, this is this is this very distinct problem, this is how you solve it with this tool. And uh, and that's also a great hook to get people into using these tools, is rather than just saying, here's we're going to toolkit, what do you do with it? You know, I say, here's a very specific use case and, and a, real, a real world problem um, that you can solve with that. And that's something I'm going to get into a little bit later. I'll go through a, a few specific examples of, you know, what, my, what problem I had, how I found a tool, how I solved the problem with that tool, and then how I, I shared that. Um, another thing, you know, I mentioned Stack Overflow before. Um, that's I love jumping on there and answering questions. Um, it's a great place to ask questions too. It's a uh, you know a lot of times if you Google for an error message something like that, you get sent to Stack Overflow. So uh, I'm a big proponent of uh, sites like that as well. So success. This is the fourth pillar of my boss system. Um, you know, once you're done, your problem solved. You expanded your toolbox. So now you can move on. So if you really make the investment, buy it, own it, sell it, success, you can move on and you know find out what's the next problem and, and uh, how can I move on and, and the, the cycle repeats itself over and over again um, in my experience. So now I'm going to do some examples of specific problems that we've had at flight, um, the tools that I identified to solve those problems, how I did it, and uh, what the results were. Um, so example number one. Uh, is what I call the great widget box purge. Um, so Flight evolved from a product called Widget Box that was created about eight years ago. Um, it was a web widget platform. Um, eventually we pivoted to become an advertising company. Um, but it was still based on the same database schema. So we had our, our old business's data and our new business's data was all sort of commingled in the same tables. Um, so 80% of data that we had in MySQL specifically was this le legacy widget box data that we didn't need anymore. So the question is, how do we delete all of the old legacy data um, without affecting the application um, and without affecting the users of, of our new product? Um, so I considered a couple of things. Um, so one was I thought about PT Archiver. So that's part of Percona Toolkit. It's been around a long time. Um, it you know it goes through and it can copy data to flat files and chunks, um, it can do deletes and chunks. Um, you know, a lot of people have used that for very similar use cases to this. Um, but I noticed this blog post that Baron had written. Um, he was the, so he was the original one who wrote PT Archiver, and then he blogged about the fact that if he were going through and deleting a bunch of data and wanted to chunk it up, he wouldn't use his own tool. He would use Common Schema. So I said, all right, if it's good enough for Baron. Um, it's worth giving a shot. Um, so I went out and, and did some research on Common Schema um, and the ways that it can, uh, you know, you can feed it a, a delete statement 
um, and it'll it'll break it up into sort of bite-sized chunks um, so that it'll minimize the transaction size and it won't impact replication as much and all that good stuff. So I ran a bunch of tests um, on our staging environment. Um, I fiddled with all the different chunk size and different levels levers that you can do like that. Um, and I actually found a bug when I was using it. So um, there's something about one of the tables I was trying to delete on um, that if I tried to use Comet Schema, it, it couldn't find the right uh, unique index. It couldn't basically couldn't find the right primary key index to, to use to do the chunking, um, so it was failing. So I found a bug report. I found a bug. Opened a bug report. Shlomi fixed it. I think the same day. So that was a quick turnaround. Um, but I had also figured out a workaround that it's you know since this is a pretty flexible tool, I had sort of come up with a way to, to trick it into doing what I wanted it to, even though this, the auto magical way didn't work. Um, so once I'd done it, I decided to sell it. You know, I found this great tool um, that solved a, a big problem that I had. Um, so when I, I went out and I wrote a blog post about it, and, you know, went through the basic problem that I had and, and uh, how I fixed it, um, hoping that I could, you know, convince other people um, how great this tool was. And, you know, I'm sure other people have similar problems and want to teach them how to, how to solve them as well. Um, so then after, you know, after I sold it, I was, you know, Here's my success. So I'd op I, I deleted 80% of the data out of these tables. I ran an optimize to rebuild the table. My IBD files, I used InnoDB. I used InnoDB files per table. My IBD files were sh shrank by 80%. So everything was great. Got rid of all the data. Well, almost everything was great. So there's still that shared data file called all IB data one And that never shrinks. So that file is still pretty big. And I don't have a good way to fix that. I think, as far as I know, the most the way most people say to do that is just to, you know, basically dump your database and re-import it, and uh, that's the only way to shrink that file. But maybe there's a maybe there's a cool tool out there that'll teach me how to do it. So I'll have to uh, find that if anybody knows how to shrink a gigantic IB data one file in all the years. So if I find that, then I'll uh, I'll start the boss process again. All right, um, example number two, uh, this same use case. But the next step is checking data consistency. So I went through on all my databases and deleted 80% of the data. So the question is, how do I know that the data is consistent across my master? I, I run master, master, active, passive, and a bunch of replicas, for, uh, read-only slaves. So how do I know across all those databases that the data is the same? Um, so that's my problem. So what did I do? So like I, as I mentioned before, PT table checksum and PT table sync are great. Um, so now it's, it's time to use those. So those were tools I knew about, and I, I looked into them, and I decided, you know, before I check some of my data, since I knew I had this purge coming up, I was like, you know what, let me wait until the purge is done, and then I'll check some it, because I don't want to check some it and fix a bunch of little inconsistencies in data that I'm just going to delete anyways. So I had sort of deferred this, knowing I was going to do it. I knew which the, what the tools were. I didn't know exactly how they worked. So. Um, you know, now it was time to finally figure out how DSNs are used. So these are the, the domain, the database service names, or whatever it is. I don't remember exactly what that stands for. But but if you use PT table checksum, um, you know, when you run it on the master, the master database has to have some way to know who its slave databases are. Um, and so there's a few different ways to do it. But uh, DSNs seemed like the way for me, so I, I had to figure that out. Um, so this was one where I did lots and lots of testing in stage. And I did some more testing. Um, I created a DSN table. Um, it's a pretty, it's a small, simple table that basically just <laughs> lists out um, the the, uh, the domain, the uh, the host names, and the ports for all of my databases, um, my replication topology, um, and then I started to run PT table checksum. Um, but then I I learned that so the first problem I learned about was um, schema different if if there's a difference, a, a, uh, an actual schema difference, not just a data row difference, but if there's a schema difference in your tables, um, PT table checksum is pretty good at checking the schemas before it runs to make sure it doesn't break replication. So assuming that the master knows who all its slave databases are, it checks the slaves and says, make sure that you know, you've got all the same tables and columns that I do, everything's copacetic before it runs. But if you don't tell it who all the slaves are, then it's just going to run. And if there's a slave database that you know, is missing a column or missing a table or whatever, it's going to fail. Um, so I learned that lesson pretty early in stage. So that was why it's important to know, tell it about the whole replication topology so that it can do the work ahead of time and check the schemas. 
Um, so once I've used PT table checksum and PT table sync um, to find the discrepancies in my data and then fix them, um, I blogged about uh, another problem that I found, um, which was the there's a flag that you can pass called no foreign key checks, um, and I don't even remember exactly what this is, but you can uh, find it on the blog. I think it was. Yeah, it's been a while since that one, but I think the, the main idea is that PT table sync, the way that it fixes um, differences that it finds is by, by issuing a replace command on the master. Um, and the, what replace is, um, is it a delete and then an insert. Um, and so the, the idea being there that you do a replace on the master and it, it's not actually making any changes on the master. The idea is that it makes changes on the slave by doing a delete and an insert. Um, and it, you know, a delete and an insert is very similar to an update, but it's not exactly the same, right? Because, for example, if you have a foreign key with cascade delete, then when you delete the parent row, the child rows are dropped too. Um, so there's a flag that you can pass to PT table sync to have it turn off the uh, foreign key check so that it won't cascade. But if you run it by default out of the box it's, and you have cascade delete foreign keys, it's actually going to delete a lot of child data. So that's something to that doesn't come back. Yes. <laughs> so it's, you know, like I said, it's a, it's a dangerous tool, and this is why you need to know how it works, right? Because it's you, you can't just blindly follow this thing and say, oh, this is great, I'm going to run this tool, and it'll magically fix all my data. You know, like I, I, I didn't have to write the tool. Somebody wrote it for me. The least I can do is look at the code and figure out how it works and say, okay, this is what it does. It does a replace. And if I don't know what replace means, because I've never used it before, then I can look that up and say, okay, replace is a delete and then an insert. And then, you know, you think that logically forward and you say, okay, I know what deletes do and cascade deletes and all that stuff. So, you know, again, it's good to own the tool, good to, to, to look at the code, and figure out what it's doing. It's, it doesn't take that long and it's worth, worth the time investment. Um, so success on example number two. So I've deleted 80% of my data. My database is small. It's running good. Um, I can sync my replicas to the master, make sure everything's consistent. Um, things are going well. All right, so example number three. Um, I touched on this briefly earlier when I talked about testing older versions of MySQL on uh, MySQL Sandbox. But uh, so PT online schema change. Um, I mentioned the way that this works is it, it can, you can alter a big table. Um, in a non-blocking way because it creates a copy, of, a secondary copy of the table and then uses triggers to copy the row data. So one of the uh, restrictions on PT Online Schema Change is if you have any triggers on a table, any triggers at all, and you try to run PT Online Schema Change, it'll say, sorry, I gotta make my own triggers. I'm not gonna, I can't do it if you have any triggers. But the issue, is, the, the issue that I had with that is that PT Online Schema Change only creates after triggers, it doesn't create before triggers. And after triggers and before triggers can live happily side by side. So the point that I tried to make was, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't prevent the tool from running on any table of triggers, it should just be if it has after triggers. And so I mentioned this to Baron a couple times and, and talked to some of the tool developers and nobody ever made the change. So finally I just went in and made a three line change in, in the Perl script to do it myself. Um, and then I put in a bug report and said, this is the three line change I made. And I don't think they've accepted it yet, but it was a, it was a good example of how, you know, if you take the time to read the code, you know, it's a gigantic Perl script, but I knew it was looking for triggers. And so I found, you know, I just sort of gripped through and found the line where it was looking for triggers and saw the way it was doing it and, and changed it to only look for after triggers. Made that change, tested it out in stage. It seemed to work pretty well. So I made my own little patch for that. And uh, it worked pretty well. So let's go back to some basic principles here, um, some reminders. So don't reinvent the wheel. This is part of the, the, the foundational principle of this methodology is, you know, we've all got similar problems as people who work with MySQL. Um, there's a lot of really smart people um, who have encountered these problems before us. And uh, there's some really smart, really nice people who have encountered them and written tools to solve those problems. Um, so let's you know, let's use those tools rather than trying to write our own tools because, uh, you know, it saves a lot of time and, you know, it's, it's the more people, rather than each one of us making our own tools and, and, and with our own bugs, you know, if we're all using the same toolkit, um, we can find the bugs, fix them, and, you know, benefits the community in general. 
Um, number two is only use tools that you understand. Um, so this is something that I, I really try to hammer on over and over again. You know, a lot of these tools are really, really easy to use, but you should not use them if you don't know what they do. It's like the point I made about PT table sync. You know, you need to know how it's implemented. It's a replace statement. You need to know with PT online schema change that it's making a copy of your table and it's going to, you know, fill up that copy of your table. So if you're trying to alter a 100 gigabyte table and you've only got 50 gigabytes of free disk space, that's not going to work, right? You, you, you know that you need two copies of that 100 gig table right before the rename. So, you know, you have to understand the tools, you have to think through it, and uh, make sure that, you know, you understand the whole process so that you don't end up shooting yourself in the foot. And of course, test it before you use it in production. That should go without saying, but, you know, a lot of people will just see these tools and they'll, they've got product access and they'll just go ripping off and using it. So always test it before you use it in production. Test it thoroughly before you use it in production. Um, so what do I mean by don't reinvent the wheel? Um, so specifically, you know, so I talked about don't write your own tools. You, you can write your own tools if you want. That's great. But, you know, it's always good to look and see if there's something that does it first. But if you're going to use a tool, let it do as much of the work as possible. Don't just use the tool halfway and then, you know, roll your own for the other half. Um, so, for example, um, when we first started using PT Heartbeat, um, you know, we have PT Heartbeat, we run it on the master database, um, and so we've got this heartbeat in all the slaves, right? So we wanted to monitor that. So we set up a, a Nagios check, and, you know, my first idea was, okay, I've got, I've got this... Uh, I know what the name of the table is that has the, t the heartbeat timestamp in it. I'll just write my own MySQL query in the Nagios check. And that actually worked pretty well. But the, the, I mean, the thing is, like, they already thought of that when they made PT Heartbeat. So there's a, there's a check command. You can use PT Heartbeat to check the heartbeat. You know, you don't need to roll your own MySQL query. You can run PT Heartbeat minus minus check and then tell it the database. And, you know, to me, that, that was a mistake I made at first as I wrote my own. And it, I mean, it wasn't a big deal, but it's like, you should use the tool the whole hundred yards, you know, not, not roll your own for the last, if you don't have to. Um, only use tools you understand. Um, so this is a point I've, I've tried to reiterate again and again, is that there's a lot of great tools, very tempting to use them, but look at the code, know, at least know what they're doing and how they're doing it, um, so you don't end up like that guy. Um, so get to know the, cool, the code, you know, this is something I touched upon before, is that, you know, a, Database internals are very intimidating. Most of us don't want to go in and look at MySQL server code. But tool code is actually not very intimidating. You know, if you crack open some of these scripts, it's pretty straightforward what they do. It doesn't take very long to read it. So that's my recommendation is just open up the code, take a look at it, get to know it. Um, and you should never run a tool. Well, this, this is my own personal thing. Um, is I never run a tool with the default options. Default options are usually pretty good, right? Like the whoever created the tool knows the way people use it, um, so they try to put sensible defaults in. Um, but in my way of thinking, my methodology is I want to know everything the tool's doing. So rather than just running it with defaults, I'm going to explicitly pass in all the arguments, even if they're the defaults, because that way it gets sort of reinforces in my mind and to anyone who reads my code and looks at the and looks at the commands, it reinforces what all the arguments are and all the parameters are being passed to the tool. So I know not everybody feels this way, but this is sort of a personal thing that I've done is I never run it with the defaults. I try to pass, pass in all the arguments as much as I can. Um, so that, yeah, that's, I guess that's what the third point is, is explicitly declare the options so that you force yourself to see them and think about them. Um, because it's too easy with the defaults to just run it, and then if you have a problem, you know, you have to go back and say what were the defaults, what were the parameters it was running with. So I think it's much better to spell them out explicitly and uh, that way, you know, it's right there, right in front of you. Um, so, yeah, like I said, you should learn the way the tool works. These tools, a lot of these tools seem like magic. Common Schema, in particular, I think it really seems magical, but it's not magic. It's, you know, it all comes from code, so learn how it works. Um, like I said, it's easier to learn how a tool works than to try to write a tool yourself. Um, and these are some of the examples I've brought up before, is that uh, PT table checksum, if it doesn't know about all the replicas, it can break replication. So rather than saying, I know my replication topology, the tool doesn't need to know, I'll just let it run, and then I'll figure it out later, you really need to tell it about all the replicas so it can check the schemas ahead of time. PT table sync, um, it can delete child data with, 
because of cascade delete if you don't uh, use the no foreign key checks, as I mentioned. So those are both um, good examples there. Um, test it before using production. So you know, every, everybody's environments look different. Um, you know, whether you have QA or integration or build or load or stage or whatever you call it, everybody's got some non-prod environment, even if it's just your laptop, right? So test it in non-prod. Don't test it in prod. Um, again, I say this is obvious, but I've heard lots of people who run things in prod and get themselves in trouble, so don't do that. Um, and this is, again, where MySQL Sandbox comes in, makes it really easy to test stuff. So when you've got MySQL Sandbox, you've got a laptop, you've got whatever test environments, don't test in prod. Um, so what's new in MySQL 5.6? Um, so I've just upgraded to 5.6 recently. Um, people, are, people are starting to get there. Um, and I think it's good whenever you upgrade um, to reevaluate, you know, what are some things that I was doing with tools in the past that are now native functionality? Um, because it's, you know, as great as tools are that other people have written, when it's natively built into the database, that's even better. Um, so this, this is an example I mentioned before. Um, this tool called PT Slave Delay is now, you know, in 5.6, you really don't need it anymore. Um, so I linked to the docs for that and also a blog post that I wrote a couple weeks ago um, about specifically when we got up to 5.6 um, and we stopped using PT Slave Delay and started using the native functionality. Um, so this is just another sort of a good hygiene thing when you're upgrading. Go back and see if, if you still need to use all the same tools you did and use them the way that you did before. Um, so other things in 5.6, um, I mentioned this before, do you still need to use PT Online Schema Change or not? Um, you know, there's a lot of online DDL that you can do that's built into 5.6, but uh, it's a little bit complicated in terms of what things are actually online and what things are not online, and even if it's online in the master, it could be blocking in the slave, so um, I encourage uh, people to read this uh, blog post that Morgan Talker wrote, um, which really goes through in great detail. Um, all of the online DDL features in 5.6 um, and, you know, what's online and what's not online. Um, so if you read that, you get a better understanding of it and then you can figure out, you know, whether you still need to use PT Online Schema Change or whether uh, you can just run an alter table on your prod database and not worry about it. Uh, PT Heartbeat, do we still need that? Um, we do, actually, because it's more accurate than seconds behind master. I had seen in the 5.6 docs that there was a thing called master heartbeat period. And when I saw it at first, I was like, oh, great, heartbeat. You know, I don't need PT heartbeat anymore. It must be built in. Um, but what that is is just a way to configure how often um, the master, how often the slave uh, checks master connectivity or something like that. So, like, when you get one of those timeouts, how often it reconnects, something like that. But I don't remember exactly what it does, but it doesn't do what PT heartbeat does. So, yes, we still need PT heartbeat. Um, okay, choosing the right tool for the job. So this is another, it's a great problem to have, right, is that when you've got something you need to do and there's multiple tools that can do it, um, you get to choose the right tool for the job. So this is a specific case that I talked about before with bulk deletes, whether you use PT Archive or Common Schema. I think Common Schema, for the most part, is the better tool for the job, but try it for yourself. There are, uh, both tools are out there and, and free. Um, so online DDL, this, there's actually a few different ways to do that. So there's PT Online Schema Change I mentioned before. There's also Oak Online Alter Table, um, which is uh, part of Open Arc Kit, another Shlomi Noak toolkit. Um, oh, so Oak Online Alter Table, uh, as I understand it, is, is basically implemented the same way as PT Online Schema Change, um, where it creates a copy of the table and uses triggers to keep them in sync and then does a rename at the end. Um, it's a little bit friendlier, uh, more trigger friendly. Like I mentioned, the difference between before and after triggers. Um, it's actually smart enough to check and say, oh, you've got before triggers, that's fine, I only need to do after triggers, we're good. Um, so that's, an, that's another good tool. It's, I would think it's probably fewer people are using it, um, and it's a little bit older, so that's worth considering um, if you're choosing which tool to use. And then, you know, like I said, online DDL has, has come a long way in MySQL 5.6 in terms of what sort of operations, adding indexes, and, uh, you know, adding columns, dropping columns, things like that. Um, that some of those are not blocking operations anymore. Um, so here's another another tool choice that I had to make recently. Um, so there's some data that I store in my database um, that's in JSON format, um, and there's reports that I need to create um, for users where I, I basically parse 
columns out of that JSON data um, and treat those as virtual columns. Um, and so this common schema was what I was using at first um, to, to do the JSON parsing. But the JSON parsing in common schema is written as a stored procedure. Um, and stored procedures are really, 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 really slow um, for this kind of thing. Um, so then I found out um, on the MySQL labs.mysql.com uh, that they have some built-in user-defined functions um, that do JSON parsing now. Um, there's all sorts of warnings about on these functions that like they're not for production use or for testing only and this and that. But the great thing is they're UDFs. So you know UDFs are written in, in C and they're you know super duper fast compared to store procedures. Like in my experience, like a hundred times faster. So that was pretty cool when I found those and realized I could do the same thing I was doing with Common Schema, but run it a hundred times faster. Um, so yeah, so I, I don't know how many people do JSON parsing in MySQL. Um, it's probably not looked at as a great practice in general to store things in JSON format and then trying to try to parse them out. Um, based on my blog traffic, this is actually something that people are really interested in. Um, so the MySQL JSON UDF serve are pretty cool. You should give those a try um, if that's something you need to do. How would you look at the code for that? You have to, it's probably a little more tangled than looking at Perl code. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah, so I haven't, I have, you know, I've used the MySQL JSON UDFs. Um, I've written <coughs> a blog post about that. Um, I haven't looked at the code myself. I mean, I think it's C probably, um, which is fairly readable. But I don't know when you download it whether what uh, whether it's still readable. The it's done there. That's a good question. But, uh, but yeah, that is one where I'm having more blind faith in it. But it's, I mean, this, the way that I use this is as a, in a read-only manner. And so I'm, you know, I'm basically just using it as a function or to, to extract a column, uh, and a virtual column from inside this large string column of data. Um, and it's pretty easy for me to test it and make sure it's giving me the right results. So I'm a little bit less leery about it doing sure. something wrong. Um, and I can side-by-side -side it against common schema to make sure it doesn't say anything. But, but yeah, that's a good point. That uh, the code at this point, it's, as a, as the code gets closer to the server, it gets faster, but it gets a little bit more uh, obfuscated as well. Um, so in conclusion, um, be a boss. Buy it, own it, sell it, success. Um, it's a methodology that's worked really well for me. I think um, you know you guys can all do the same thing. So try to try to remember those four magic uh, letters. Be a boss. Always look for a better way. Um, you know, like I'll, just because you've you've solved the problem and you found a tool and it works, um, you can still come back and you know there's always room for improvement. Um, like I said, the thing with Common Schema, I had these reports, they worked, but then I made them a hundred times faster. Um, PT slave delay, I mentioned. You know, I had a good way to have my delayed replica seven days behind. It works pretty well, but doing it internally is better. So, you know, once you once you've sort of solve the problem and, and put it off to the side, you know, it's good to revisit it every once in a while. Um, in particular for me, now that I'm, I've upgraded to 5.6, I'm going back and revisiting a lot of this stuff. Um, but yeah, always look for a better way um, because there's always room for improvement. And then share your experiences with the community. This is, this is a big one for me. Um, this is something that I'm really passionate about is, you know, trying to learn from other people and, and teach other people. So when you solve a problem, you know, blog about it. Um, go on to Q and A sites. Share your uh, share what you've learned with people. Um, so believe it or not, I think that's it. Um, but I'm you know I'll stick around. We can do do some Q and A. But here's my email address. If anybody wants to get in touch with me, my Twitter handle and my blog. So mostly what I'm blogging about these days um, is the five six upgrade. Um, so we went up to five six, and I blogged about certain things we're doing, like trying to get rid of my ISM and put everything in an ODB. We've got some full text indexes that we've been putting over to, to you know, DB, I used PT Upgrade. That was a tool I didn't even mention tonight. Um, PT Upgrade was a cool tool that I was able to go back and compare the way that, you know, take all these full text queries that I was running against my ISAM, run them against an ODB, make sure the results are the same. Um, I'm going to start playing with the performance schema some now that we're in 5.6. Um, so that's something I'm hoping to blog about um, once I get into that a little bit. Um, so if you follow the blog, uh, you can see what I'm up to there. So. Any uh, any questions? Yes. Are all these tools going to work equally as well with MariaDB? Uh, so the question is whether all of these tools will work equally well with MariaDB as they do with MySQL Community Server or Percona Server, etc. Um, I would think the vast majority of them would. 
Uh, I'm not personally a MariaDB user, um, but I would think uh, for the most part, most of the, at least in the specific examples I've touched on, um, most of those are not going to vary a lot with MariaDB. Um, I would think you know a lot of the changes in MariaDB are around the optimizer and things like that, and, and you know storage engines and stuff that they've added on. Um, so, so yeah, I would think in general most of these tools are pretty agnostic in terms of uh, which distribution you're using. Good question. And at the, just to that point, this, the the one that we use at Flight, at Flight we use Percona Server. Yeah, Tim. Do you have any concerns for things like, <clears throat> you mentioned Shlomi's tool for taking a really big delete, for example, and chunking it to really you know, certainly help with locking transactions. Yeah. Like and the PT online scheme of change. Yeah. So these are, Shlomi's a great guy, and I'm sure he's tested it as hard as he can. Yeah. But this is your job. And, like, do you have concerns running some of these tools? Like, you can only test them so far in a sandbox or do a, a parallel. You get in the middle of a PT online scheme of change and something goes wrong. You pick the phone up, does Percona help you? If you don't have a support contract, are these kind of use them on your own? And, get support from the community. Like, what, yeah. are, what are your thoughts on, on that piece of it? Because many of these utilities are just like nice to have. Yeah. But some of them are right in the middle of everything you do for a living. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's a good question. The question is basically on, you know, when you're using these tools to make big changes to your database, what do you do if something goes wrong? How do you know if something goes wrong? You know, since these are open source tools, or the, is there support around them, et cetera? So yeah, so that's a really good question. I mean, I, for me, uh, you know, I, I talk about testing in non-prod a lot, but a lot of the testing I do is with my production database, but just a you know an extra copy of the production database because you know I'm in a I'm out, I'm in the cloud I'm in I have a lot of replication I can spin up an extra replica of my production database very easily. So even though I'm not running it on an active prod server, you know I don't run anything on prod on the prod data set the, the active prod data set without running it on a passive database first. Um, but yeah, it's, it's certainly a good, it's a good, it's a good question. You know, you, you, there's a trade-off involved um, when you start using somebody else's tools to, to do important work that changes your data, um, and so you have to decide, you know, what your risk tolerance is there. Um, and you know, a lot of it has to do with with the nature of your data, and you know, what, you know how how bad is it if if the data changes, or you know what. You know how how valuable is the data, and how important is uh, uh, you know exact data fidelity, and you know just knowing your database and knowing where the vulnerabilities are too. You know, I think I've been you know I've been at Flight for seven years, and I know I know our database inside and out, and so I really can sort of anticipate where those problems would be. Um, but yeah, but if it's you know if you've started a job at some company and you don't really know the database that well, and you start letting some of these things rip. Um, yeah, there's certainly risk involved there, and uh, you know if it if it breaks your data and you call Percona, you know they if you're not a paying customer, they you know they may try to help you a little bit, but they're not going to bend over backwards to fix your problem because it's really you know buyer beware mm -hmm. when you take one of these tools and uh, run it on your database. Yeah, so there's certainly risks involved there, and uh, it you know it goes again to, to testing and and. Uh, and you know, a lot of that is about you know, it's not just about testing outside of production. It's about knowing the right way to test things so that so that you know that they're doing the right thing and they're not breaking things, and and that you know you the, you you run it through your first iteration and everything's good. But how do you know that the tenth iteration? Yeah. You know, so that you you need to have the right test plan in place so that you know that future iterations will be safe as well. And uh, and a lot of that for me too is that you know some of these tools are things that I'll run in an automated fashion. Um, but a lot of them I'll, I will run manually. You know, when I did the big data purge and went and got rid of all of our late legacy data, that was something I was manually running so that I could keep an eye on it. You know, I don't want that running from a cron job that kicks off every week um, because then, you know, the, the failures would be much more silent. Um, so that's, yeah, that's another approach is I do try to run things. You know, I try to automate, automate, automate as much as I can, but if it's something big and invasive and a one-time thing, I definitely run it manually. Any other questions? How are you finding five six? Uh, so far, pretty good. It's uh, so we we upgraded to five six on May sixth. I remember <laughs> I remember <laughs> that. <laughs> that we got on the five six and, uh, five six on five six. Um, so yeah, so we've been on it for three months, um, and it's worked. It's worked well for us. Um, you know, I've heard some people have had some performance issues and, and things with it, um, but uh, but yeah, for us, it's been good. 
Um, it's been all, all pluses for the most part. Um, there was actually a bug I was looking at today with the, uh, you know, so I, like I said, we use full text indexes. Um, I know not everybody uses the, the MySQL full text indexing, but we use those, and I'd run a lot of tests to make sure that I could change my table state in ODB and everything was the same. Um, but I found a bug today where if you put certain characters get passed um, into the full text search, it was the, it's the at sign um, that it worked on my ISM, but on in ODB it's actually failing with an error. So if you just do it, it, it was only in Boolean mode and full text search for those who know that, but if you pass the at character to it, it breaks. So, you know, there's little things like that. Uh, but one of the things I'm most excited about in 5.6 is performance schema, um, that I really want to start getting in and using that. Um, and I haven't even gotten to that yet, so that's something that I'm excited about. But, uh, but yeah, so far so good with 5.6, you know, other, that, that, that at character thing is, is one that I may end up going back to my ISAM for some of those tables temporarily until I can figure out if there's a workaround or, you know, submit a bug to a report. But uh, overall, it's been pretty good. There was another bug report that I sent um, to the MySQL bug site. I can't forget what, it, what I forget what it is at the moment. But overall, it's been really good. Other questions? Yeah. Are these <coughs> tools will work on all flavors of Linux, or is it? Uh, there, is it? Do you have a preference for a flavor of Linux for using these particular tools? Or? Um, yeah, so the question is whether these work on all flavors of, of Linux or, you know, basically what operating systems do I prefer or do these tools prefer? Um, you know, that's, it's, uh, it's not something I've had an issue with. I mean, there's certainly dependencies, um, you know, for kind of toolkit is Perl, so, you know, it, it depends on, you need to have Perl and certain versions of Perl. Um, some of, uh, some of Shlomi's stuff I think is Python, um, so you need to have Python and a version of that. Um, will be relevant, um, but yeah. But for the most part, I think these tools, especially if you're in a you know a Linux or Ubuntu or CentOS environment, they're uh, they're pretty. They, they'll work the same, in my experience, on all. I mean, we've run so we're in the Amazon cloud, um, and we've run I've run databases on Linux, CentOS, and Ubuntu, and it's uh, the tools have, have worked pretty consistently. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend having your database topology on a bunch of different OSs, but. In my experience, they've all worked pretty much the same. Other questions? Anyone? All right, good. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'll stick around for a little while if anybody wants to chat, or if uh, I may head over to Meet Hall in a little while and get a beer if anybody wants to go grab a beer and continue the conversation. But again, thanks everybody for making the trip.